You may be seated. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome families and friends. Welcome university faculty and staff. Welcome distinguished guests, Dr. May Jemison and Dr. Vice Provost Lisa Garcia Badoya. And welcome, graduates. <laughs> welcome to the 2024 Berkeley School of Education commencement ceremony. We are thrilled to celebrate with you today. My name is Michelle Young, and I am the Dean of the Berkeley School of Education, and it is my distinct honor to be here with you this evening for this incredibly important event. We truly value the hard work and accomplishments of our 2024 graduates and the support of their loved ones who have traveled here from far and near to celebrate with us. So therefore, I'm going to begin with some guidance for this evening so that our graduates feel celebrated and our family and friends are able to fully enjoy their time with us. Please silence your phones. Stay in your seats and keep the aisles clear. And join me in embracing the Berkeley principles of community. It is also customer, customary here at Berkeley to begin our commencement ceremony with a land acknowledgement. And I'm happy to say that this evening, Maria Rojas Concha, who is graduating with a PhD this year from the Berkeley School of Education, will provide the land acknowledgement for us this evening. Maria? When the dean asked me, a non-native of this land, to offer a land acknowledgement, I was honored, but also terrified. I was eager to recognize that the University of California, Berkeley, sits in the territory of the Huching, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people, who continue to be flourishing members of the Bay Area community. But I was terrified because even though I understand that it is important to acknowledge that every member of the Berkeley community has and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the, since the institution's funding in 1868, for many, land acknowledgement have become performative and meaningless repetitions that fail to disrupt colonial logics of dispossession and displacement. Today, I want, you, I want to invite you all to move from acknowledgement to reparations. Since you or your loved ones have benefited from this, line, from this land, I invite you to do three things. First, learn about indigenous people's spirituality, knowledge, and contributions. Second, teach about it. And third, pay your land tax. If you benefit from housing and food security. One way to do this is through the Shumi land tax. You are welcome to take out your phones and search. Pay Shumi land tax. I'm going to give you a few seconds so you can take out your phones and I'm gonna spell it for you. <laughs> so it's S as Saturn, H as Hamas, U U as Uranus, M as Mars, and I as impact, land tax. Finally, let's continue the dialogue on how Berkeley can join the effort toward meaningful compensation for indigenous communities in pursuit of reconciliation and justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria, for those concrete examples of how to engage in reparation. Our event this evening offers an opportunity to recognize each of our incredibly impressive graduates. 
We are so proud of them. They've worked very hard to get here, and they are graduating from the best public school in the world. But more importantly, they have chosen a field that will allow them to transform lives. Let's tell them how proud we are of them. Let's tell them right now. Let me hear you say it. We are proud of you. We are proud of you. Let's say it again. We are proud of you. Yes, we are. We are proud of their hard work. We are proud of their achievements, their choices, and we in the Berkeley School of Education are proud and honored to have had the opportunity to work with each of them. Our schools are where our collective future is born. If we are to function as a society, our schools must serve as sacrosanct and safe spaces for students of all abilities and from all walks of life to have the opportunity to thrive. They must be places where students and educators can engage in the joy and the intellectual challenges of learning in an environment where every individual is cherished and celebrated for exactly who they are. Each of our Berkeley graduates understands this simple truth. However, working in the field of education, though incredibly rewarding, is not an easy path. Resources and times are not infinite, and graduates, you will encounter and sometimes work right alongside people who do not share your values and ideals. But I firmly believe that you are uniquely positioned to succeed in spite of these challenges. And that is because of the type of people you are and how the Berkeley School of Education has further cultivated you and your talents. You arrived here compassionate and committed to transforming education and society for the better of all. Through your studies and research, you've extended your learning, you've deepened your commitments, and honed your ability to think outside the box for solutions to the complex challenges that our nation faces. You have learned to recognize, interrogate, and transform structures that limit and oppress. You know how to design and implement research on critical problems of practice, to hold space for all ideas, and to ensure that all voices are heard. Your intelligence and creativity, compassion, and know-how will keep you in demand anywhere in the world you wish to live and work. In short, you have become the kind of leaders, educators, school psychologists, scholars, and human beings that future generations so richly deserve. I have such confidence in your ability to make a difference, to educate like democracy depends on it, because we all know that it does. I am so glad that you chose Berkeley and allowed us the privilege of joining you on this academic journey, and I look forward to seeing you thrive as innovators and change makers in our field, people who create a better place, a better future for students from all walks of life. They need you, we need you, and the world needs you. Go forth and ignite a brighter world for all. As they say here at Berkeley, fiat lux, let there be light, and congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat> we have 
an inspiring lineup of speakers this evening. Our first speaker is Amy Eagle. As some of you know, Amy is a graduate of the Berkeley Teacher Education Program. And Amy, who comes from a family of educators, is committed to working with multilingual students and their families with integrity and authenticity. She loves the joy and curiosity that students bring to her and envisions working with children for a very long time. Amy values culturally responsive teaching and hopes to create a classroom space where students feel heard, represented, and inspired. Next fall, Amy will be teaching in a bilingual elementary school in the Mission District of San Francisco. Please join me in providing a very warm welcome to Amy Eagle. Good evening and welcome. I feel extremely honored to have been asked to speak on behalf of Berkeley's teacher education program. It could have been many of us up here sharing our experience. And as I share mine, I hope you find something to connect with your own time in our program. Friends, family, and people we belong to. I'm sure you're all wondering how we got the best, most creative, most brilliant and real future educators all in one program. Trust me, I was thinking the same thing all year. Our K-12 students are so lucky to have a group of exceptional educators ready to teach them, and I feel just as lucky to have learned beside them. I remember walking into class on the first day of our summer session nearly a year ago and trying to find where my home group was sitting as quickly as possible. Home group number two, Avery, Jesus, and Sarah were my first tethers <laughs> into a brand new space. I remember unfolding my name tent every day and putting it on the table amidst a sea of other personalized and colorful names. I remember holding the handheld mic and doing my best not to react when hearing my voice fill the room for the first time. I remember chatting with Diana, Sofia, and Julian after our first observations and debriefs. I felt awkward, excited, and a little mortified after watching a video of myself teaching for the first time. Thankfully, I had my faculty advisor and mentor, Manny, sitting next to me. <laughs> he affirmed my discomfort and then intentionally nudged me into reflection and a commitment to growth. I reflect on who I was then and how it informed the kind of teacher I wanted to be. There were so many possibilities. The trajectory of how I developed as a teacher since that very first observation has not been a clear path. I was a comet that shot through space and crashed into everything as I made impact. I crashed into discomfort, non-closure, uncertainty, and vulnerability. And there are marks that remind me of that path. During my last takeover, a time when I assumed all roles and responsibilities of the lead teacher, I was in the middle of a lesson and I started to crash. I was using every attention getter I knew and still could not hold the focus of my students. I started to panic, frustrated, embarrassed, and a little defeated that my lesson was not going as planned. Manny, who was observing, calmly approached me in a moment of transition and asked if I was open to real-time feedback. I enthusiastically and desperately nodded, yes. <laughs> he said, you're being a little too nice. Be firm, stand in your authority. Find your teacher voice, it's there, it's in you, use it. In this moment, 
As Manny reminded me of my power, he was my bridge. In Transformative Arts, we read a piece of work called The Bridge Poem by black queer feminist Kate Russian. As a white cis woman, it's important for me to read the work of those whose voices are often excluded from mainstream storytelling. Proving that brilliant, truthful writing creates connection across identities, there is a line that resonated intensely with my journey this year, and it reads, the bridge I must be is the bridge to my own power. When I first read this line, I connected to the essence of standing up for myself and believing in my own power. I spent the year surrounded by this group's authenticity and willingness to be vulnerable, inspired, yet sometimes feeling like an imposter. I had plenty of opportunities to learn from my mistakes and question my abilities to teach with the capacity that the BTEP faculty believed I could. Reading this poem reminded me of all the power I had accumulated this year. All I needed to do was connect myself to it. As a teacher, I constantly bridge. I bridge students to school, families to their students' learning, new content to background knowledge, languages to other languages. But I can only be this bridge, one that can transcend hardship and stay strong enough for others to cross unless I have traced the path and memorized the route on the bridge to my own power. The bridge I must be is the bridge to my own power so that I can be the person who holds the hand of my students as they cross the bridge to their own power. I want to be the person holding a sign with their name on the sidelines cheering them on. I want to be able to nudge them a little closer to taking the first step over open water. Who helped you draw the blueprints for your bridge? Which person held your hand as you crossed it for the first time? Who passed you the tools you needed to rebuild your bridge after a storm? The bridge our students must be is the bridge to their own power. So ground yourself and reach out until you've reinforced every piece of a child's wavering bridge. Hold the hand of every child as they cross their bridge to their own becomings. I've been stretched far too thin between different worlds. Let too many people walk over the bridge across my back. But those days are over. I belong in my power. And so do you, and so do they. Together, we can create suspension and connection across seas for generations to come. There are people who came before us, and people here now, who have helped each of us build or find a bridge to something. The bridges are there, and they're only the beginning. Cross them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you for reminding us of the importance of relationships and reflection and being the bridge of our power to others. Our second speaker this evening is Olufemi Ogundeli. <laughs> Femi is graduating this year with his Doctorate of Education from the inaugural cohort of the Leaders for Equity and Democracy Doctoral Program. In his capacity as Associate Vice Chancellor of Admissions and Enrollment here at UC Berkeley, Femi is a member of the Chancellor's Cabinet and he oversees the offices of undergraduate admission, financial aid, the university registrar, the visitor center, and the center for educational partnerships. Femi's vision and leadership in undergraduate admissions and outreach to the state's underrepresented, undocumented, underserved, and first generation students has resulted in four straight years of record-breaking enrollment of the most ethnically and geographically diverse classes of students 
to Berkeley in three decades. Please join me in bringing a warm welcome to Femi. Good evening. I thought this was an auditorium full of people. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Femi Ogundeli, and I really appreciate you all being here this evening. I represent the Leaders in Equity and Democracy in Education doctoral program in the inaugural cohort, LEAD Cohort 1. The LEAD program recognizes that success of our democracy relies on equitable schools, which in turn rely on transformational system leaders. This program is specifically designed for scholar practitioners. And as simple as an idea as that may sound, LEAD is a profound concept that seeks to bring the best of education to the production of education. You see, the doctoral program and the doctoral experience is the pinnacle of an educational milestone. It requires more than we ever thought that we had and more than we ever thought that we had to give. But in order to really make a difference, in the huge system that is education, this program speaks to those who take on the responsibility of producing the educational environments that students are navigating. This program consists of practitioners who are currently in the roles that have the greatest opportunity and willingness to make and bring meaningful change. I think I speak for the entire cohort when I say what brought us to this program was the idea that through this experience, we would be able to make a greater impact not just on the schools that we work in, but on the entire system of education. Being a scholar practitioner is not for the faint of heart. As practitioners, we know meaningful work without scholarship is fragile to current events, changes in leadership, and changes in funding. As scholars, we know that scholarship oftentimes, no matter how insightful, without work, without truly being tested in real environments and amplified by practitioners, gets written off too often as too abstract or hollow to be considered impactful by those who need to implement them. But together, bringing seasoned practitioners to scholarship and making sure that research is focused on the right issues that are impacting the profession, their combined ability to change seemingly intractable systems and to inform dynamic change and scalable change is undeniable. Leaders in Equity and Democracy aims to fill the void of both by bringing together what is known with what is currently happening in education and those who aim to produce knowledge with those who drive the results. While we were focused on finishing and standing here before you all today, I would be remiss to say that through this experience, we lived the ideals and the goals of this program. Oftentimes when we talk about community, we talk about community in, a, in regards to people or in spaces. But community is also defined by time the time in which we all connected. And let's be very clear about the time that this was. Like many who graduated this year, we had our COVID-19 classroom experiences, long Zoom classes after long days. But COVID wasn't just in our scholarship, it was in our lives too. We had school leaders that worked to keep schools open so essential workers had a place to send their children during the day, bunching, bunching three to four classes in a single gymnasium because of the teacher shortages that were happening right here in the Bay Area. We had practitioners working to keep this institution open for low SES students who had a better learning environment in an empty residence hall than they might have had back at home where they lacked reliable Wi-Fi and other educational resources. We fought against standardized testing in college admissions, which disproportionately snuffs out the brilliance of black, brown, and low-income students. We continue to fight for students and the right to express their opinions through protest on our college campuses and in high schools because we know that too often people are more interested in order than they are in justice. We fought, we toiled, and we won because we know that excellence and diversity are not mutually exclusive, but in fact you cannot have one without the other. And Martin Luther King said that when you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. It's each of our part to help build what is called the beloved community. Additionally, while in quarantine, we endeavored through the program, we endeavored through this program while the out loud racial reckoning of the Black Lives Matter movement was happening all in front of our faces. 
the violent and public recognition of a lauded system of policing in American democracy and its irregard and hatred for black youth, black men, and black children was happening in front of our faces. The idea of, uh, the idea of protect and serve was being questioned at best and shouted down through chants of I can't breathe, justice for Brianna, and no justice, no peace. I've never protested in my life, and I found myself on the streets of Oakland for days with a rage against the machine and, an, and a system that sought, out to that sought out the destruction of people who look like me. While in this program, it was impossible not to see this system and all of its failures and not think about the system that we occupy, the system of education that we hold up, the excuses that we make for the disproportionate outcomes that we, as career practitioners, produce. In the LEAD program, we believe in order to lead a system, you must be able to see it. And that is all of it. You see, there are no dress rehearsals for educators. We didn't get the benefit of observing someone else do it before we got there, or the time to think through all the possible scenarios. And in, un in unprecedented times, we were forced to do. We were called to act, making incredibly stressful decisions when the stakes were at their highest. It was in this time that our faculty challenged us not to, not to get mad, but to get to work, to pour into the literature, find the solutions, and remember the power that we hold and the ability to put them into practice. We are challenged by our faculty and by each other to do what Bear Rustin called become angelic troublemakers and take what we know and what we are learning and put it into practice. We leaned into the words of Bell Hooks who said, the academy is not paradise, but learning is a place where paradise can be created. As scholars, we kept our community through Zoom screens and face masks, physically isolated, but together as an intellectual and professional journey that we will remember for a lifetime. Late nights after early mornings, after some of the most trying days of our careers. We set up in-school wellness centers for students who were disproportionately disciplined in high schools. We traveled to refugee camps to find educational excellence in the most challenging parts of the world to bring them to our public universities. We joined research groups and published in peer-reviewed journals, being in this program required us to push back on the status quo in all of our educational settings and thinking of better ways in which we can design things for students rather than asking them to navigate our deficiencies. LEAD required this of us. We kept committed to our goals to be right here before you all, representing cohort one of a provocative concept that is known as Leaders for Equity and Democracy in the doctoral program. Throughout our learning, we did what we did, we know, will be studied for years to come. Our impacts will be researched and analyzed and turned into case studies because we lived it. We know that we will be that piece of data that is the outlier in that research because we lived it. LEAD is an embodied experience, a continuous cycle of improvement and, an, of improvement and, an un, and to understand that you can't solve cross-sector problems with single-sector solutions. LEAD requires the best of us. As we stand here at the completion of this program, we recognize the responsibilities and the positions that we hold, the knowledge and the influences that we have to make a change. As members of this community, we will take this path forever, another provocative but simple understanding that as leaders in education, we either design systems for equity or we perpetuate inequity. And for us, that means holding each other, our colleagues, our schools, and our systems accountable to serve every single student that we interact with. To our esteemed faculty and the Berkeley School of Education, sincere gratitude for the time and the space that you gave us to grow into the scholars that we are. They say the worst patients are doctors, and I'm certain that the worst students are educators, without a doubt in my mind. And so I appreciate their patience, as well as their ability for us to create our scholarly identities to solve complex problems and remind us that we hold the power to shape the future for many generations to come. To our family, almost every time that we engaged as a cohort, we described how our families have supported us, held us up, put up with us, and pushed us to be here. I know if we had a chance to add your names to our diplomas, we would absolutely do that. But since we can, we want to call you out here today. For those that we lost, I know that there are people who, I know that there are people here with us today that are unseen, but are absolutely felt deeply Parents, siblings, grandparents, family members, mentors. We continue to mourn you at events like this because we know that you would be here cheering us on 
but we thank you for the love that you have given us and the memories that fuel us and remind us the importance of living with purpose and with passion. To cohort one, second to none, scholars, practitioners, if leading was easy, everybody would do it. We know that. But leading is not, leading is not what we do. It is who we are. It is our calling. Let's never confuse movement with progress and always continue to push to make education better because we know how many hopes and dreams are relying on us to fix the systems just to give them a chance. And when the times get hard and the mountains feel steep, when the wind is in your wings beginning to blow and swirl us in all of the directions, just remember that turbulence is the price we pay for flying high. Congratulations, we did it, and I'll see you at work. Thank you, Femi, for those important reminders about living one's leadership and the role that we must all play in building the beloved community.